The ideas expressed in the following presentations are those of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect the views of ACI or its committees. ACI web sessions are recorded at ACI conventions or other concrete industry events and will be made available for viewing free of charge for one week. Thereafter, they will be archived on the ACI website or added to ACI's online CEU program, depending on their content. Our next speaker uh, will be uh, Sidney Friedman uh, from PCI Chicago. He's the director of Architectural Precast Services. Uh, Sid has been involved with Architectural Precast for over 40 years and definitely is the go-to resource if you're working on Architectural Precast. And uh, he was the main author of Architectural Precast Panel, um, MNL 122, which is published by PCI. And uh, he's, he's published many other um, uh, precast uh, publications. I am not John Early. Uh, you're going to see a lot of, uh, Deborah showed a lot of historic structures. You're going to see a lot of uh, black and white uh, pictures that I'm going to show. Most of them are from the uh, 1930s. So they're all uh, black and white. The um, National Historic Preservation Act of uh, 1996 is uh, an act based on the belief that the spirit and direction of the nation are uh, founded and uh, reflected in the, our historic heritage. However, some of the buildings shown in this presentation have probably been demolished while others are being repaired. The uh, main one that uh, I have a concern about is the David Taylor model uh, basin, which I'll go into some detail on. Uh, that's in uh, Cotterock, uh, Maryland. That's really the first building uh, related to architectural precast. Um, between the uh, years of 1913 and 1935, uh, was uh, the time when uh, family enterprises uh, using uh, skilled artisans created a demand for cast stone, as uh, Deborah showed, as a substitute for natural stone on building facings, sills, lintels, stairs, and architectural ornamentations. Unfortunately, the technology for this product was not fully developed, with uh, many producers lacking both knowledge and skill, the product failed to withstand the normal attrition of weather and other durability issues. As a result, the industry at that time did not uh, pro progress very far. We do have a, an active uh, a cast stone industry today uh, because there were studies that were done by the Natural, National Bureau of Standards to uh, determine what characteristics uh, cast stone needed. A few, uh, during the late 1930s, a few architects cautiously began to use architectural concrete slabs for industrial and office buildings. The early studio did the slab work for these early buildings, uh, notably the Squibb Laboratories in New Brunswick, New Jersey, and the Normandy Building in Washington, D.C., and these were done in 1938. However, John Early and Basil Taylor, the founders of the uh, early studios, soon came to realize that the use of precast slabs could never uh, gain uh, much general use without more manufacturers entering into the precasting uh, field. They hoped to use the studio to become a center for the training and uh, inspiration of other craftsmen with the vision, tenacity, and courage to carry on in a field whose potential seemed un unlimited. This is uh, John Early and Basil Taylor, his partner John Early is on the, uh, the left. 
early licensed other firms to use the early process and brought their craftsmen into his plant for training. This licensing and training policy was so effective that uh, thin slabs became generally available throughout the East by 1939, and some of the new producers became formidable competitors of the early studio. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, ACI had a publication, which is obviously long obsolete, on thin precast slabs of uh, three inches. This is the David W. Taylor model testing basin in Cadillac, Maryland. Uh, this was a pivotal development for the uh, precast industry, which occurred in uh, 1938 when uh, the building uh, was uh, completed. The exterior surfaces of most of the buildings were faced with precast exposed aggregate reinforced concrete panels, which served as the outside form against which the structural concrete was cast. Whoops, I keep on trying to push the top one. Uh, the walls of the office building uh, reinforced concrete also cast against two-inch forms of exposed aggregate concrete. Uh, since this type of uh, exposed aggregate concrete was originated and developed by John Early, he was retained as an expert consultant for the work. However, the actual production of the panels for this project totaling some 135,000 square feet, was undertaken by the Dextone Company in New Haven, Connecticut, a cast stone manufacturer who had no previous experience in the production of this type of panel. Since the process was far from simple, considerable, uh, well, consideration was, uh, was required for the development of facilities and training uh, uh, performed by the early studios before a product was acceptable, the uh, quality was obtained. This is the model basin shop building. The panels for the shop building uh, are shown in place, ready to receive concrete. Most of the slabs were uh, either eight or 10 feet high by uh, eight feet wide with a two inch uh, thickness of concrete. Despite this unusual large surface area, it isn't large by today's standard, by in those days before we had the cranes, panels got, well, panels have gotten bigger and bigger within the precast industry as we have the capacity to lift large surfaces. But uh, these panels uh, weighed only uh, 2,000 pounds and were able to be easily handled with uh, ordinary uh, uh, stone setting derricks. This is the um, model basin uh, drawings. Uh, the architectural panels on the main entrance tower of the uh, model basin uh, served as the forms for the cast in place concrete, uh, eliminating the necessity for outer forms. Returns were also intricately cast with the facing. Working uh, from the experience obtained on the model basin, Louis Falco of the Dextone Company decided to make the exposed aggregate architectural slabs available for industrial purposes throughout the country. Falco filed for registration of the trademark Mose in December 1939, stating the name was in use since September of 1937. Since everyone was calling Early Works a the early work slabs, a uh, concrete mosaic. Uh, it was an easy, uh, easy process to see uh, how the name was uh, developed. In early mosaics, aggregate particles were substituted for the usual tesserae. The principal organization for precasters in those days was the Castone Institute. Falco, who was a member of this group, invited seven members uh, uh, of the Castone Institute to join him in forming a new group. 
And this group was called the uh, Mosaic Associates, and it was formed in 1940. And it later became the Mosaic Institute, as you can see here, in 1958. Disseminating the uh, proper technical information was the number one problem in the early days. Falco got, ar got around this one problem by sending a gentleman, Herman Frauenfelder, a man who was schooled in the in and outs of the mosaic precasting to the different member c companies where he passed along the same proprietary information. By 1969, there were 22 members in the United States, Canada, and Japan. Along with the license fee came a geographic territory in which no other licensee would be, it would be issued for manufacture. This was not considered restraint of trade as you were able to ship into uh, any, uh, any other territory. But the license required dissemination of technical information between uh, the members and forbid the distribution to uh, non-members. In fact, plants uh, were not open for visits other than to Rosé uh, members. I, I'll tell you a quick aside. I gave a presentation at uh, a Mosé meeting, uh, and as soon as I finished my presentation, they asked me to leave. Uh, but uh, so that I wouldn't get any of their secret information. But one of the producers said, well, I'll, I'll take you to my plant. I'll take you to see my plant. So uh, this was in Richmond, Virginia, and uh, the next day uh, he drove up in his car, got in his car, and he took me to see his plant. Well, how did he take me to see he drove around the outside of the plant, and <laughs> that's my plant. Uh, that's how things were kept. There was no sharing if you weren't a Mosé member. Some of the, um, trying to pry the basic information on the Mosé formula was about as futile as trying to break into Fort Knox. Uh, the whole thing was kept carefully under wraps. Uh, certain general facts were allowed to leak out. As you can see here, uh, it, the thicknesses were typically uh, two inches. The size ranged between uh, 20 and 100 uh, square feet. The reinforcement was uh, 4 by 4, uh, 3 and 3 eighths uh, inch galvanized. There were anchor loops that attached to the reinforcement, uh, and you'll see a photograph a little later on. They were 1 inch wide by uh, 3 30 seconds thick uh, galvanized uh, strap iron uh, hooked at 2 foot intervals. The facing and backing were one inch thick each with five inch in aggregate. The compressor strength was 7,500 PSI cube strength and the absorption less than 5%. Uh, uh, today, the precast industry says that uh, you want to have less than 6%, but uh, at that time uh, they came up with five, which is uh, fairly close. I'm going to go through some of the uh, production uh, slides. Uh, uh, molds were typically constructed of, of wood, shellacked, and then lined with uh, masonite, uh, similar to what John Early used. The masonite lining was given two coats of shellac, then coated with a solution consisting of one-third castor oil and two-thirds shellac. Shown here is a form for a two-inch mosaic slab with a ten-inch return. The workman is filling the joints of the form with molding plaster to prevent leaks. Before casting, the forms were greased with a mixture consisting of one gallon of animal fat, which is tallow or lard oil, to five pounds of ground soapstone to prevent sticking uh, of the uh, casting to the mold. And that was their release agent. With this treatment, forms could be reused approximately 60 times before uh, relining was required. After the particular form had been built, it was coated with a retarder. The exact chemical uh, composition of the surface retarder used was closely held information, as were all other technical information. 
uh, and an inspector is shown checking the form for the tolerances, the size and shape of the, uh, the panel. The reinforcing mesh uh, was temporarily placed in the forms to, to uh, check for the proper fit. The batch of the uh, facing mix uh, is shown here discharged from the mixer. Note the stiffness of the mix. It's a little difficult to uh, tell in some of these black and white photos. Uh, you can see how, uh, how things were a little, little more primitive than they are today, just a little bit. Um, after the uh, facing mix was placed and uh, vibrated with a plate vibrator, sometimes a great vibrator, the reinforcement was placed in position on top of the vibrated facing uh, but not less than uh, three-quarter inch back from the uh, face of the panel. The Bob Ambrose, who's an expert on John Early, is sitting there shaking his head when I'm <laughs> mentioning some of the facts. This is what uh, Early did in uh, his facility. The uh, reinforcing uh, mesh uh, was uh, held in the proper position uh, in the middle thickness of the slab by small mounds of the backing mix under the mesh. It was important to keep the mesh, obviously, in the proper position to prevent corrosion of the steel. Uh, a batch of the backing mix is shown just discharged from the mixer. Note that this mix is less stiff than the facing mix. The backing mix is uh, then... Uh, placed and vibrated. Again, it's either a plate or a, a great a vibrator. Here the uh, workman is uh, vibrating the slab in its final stages. The uh, top of the side form is re receiving vibration. This is uh, done to help the mix go into place at the slab ed ends. And the returns were cast in a vertical position and were vibrated internally with a half-inch rod pushed into the concrete. They didn't have the uh, vibration, vibration processes that we have today. Uh, this is the uh, stripping process. Uh, the panels were removed from the molds uh, before the surface was uh, thoroughly hardened, usually within 12 to 24 hours, depending on the uh, air temperature. It was uh, 12 to 14 hours when the temperature was 80 degrees Fahrenheit and 18 to 24 hours when it was 50 degrees. The lower temperature was preferable to avoid excessive shrinkage resulting in hairline cracks. A typical slab is uh, shown being lifted from the form. Note that there are excelsior filled uh, sacks for the protection of the uh, slab uh, edges and also that the, the you can see there is the uh, uh, casting date the um, mark number and the uh, piece number uh, all written on the uh, back of the panel the lifting was uh, done slowly without jerking as the panels were less than 18 hours old As soon as the uh, panel was removed from the mold, it was stacked on a vertical, in a vertical position on a uh, traveling easel and gone over with an electrically driven belt sander to remove excess mortar on the face, and then wire brush to remove the surface mortar and expose the aggregate in their true colors. Each panel was then checked for size uh, broken edges, sand pockets, and repaired if necessary. Repair, repairs were made within 36 hours of casting. The panels were initially cured for three days, being thoroughly sprayed with water at least twice a day. On the third day, a solution of one part of hydrochloric acid to five parts of water was applied and then brushed off with using plenty of water. The proper degree of acid etching of, uh, for uniform texture was then checked under a very strong light. 
At the end of this curing period, slabs were given a preliminary coating and subjected to a smearing operation to fill in small occasional voids, which occur uh, in spite of the most careful casting. Then surface treating and hardening chemicals were incorporated on the face. Mose had a manual uh, with complete instructions covering brushing out and smearing in. The slabs then were subjected to further uh, curing for four more days, wetting them twice again twice daily. On the seventh day, they were given a final light acid etch wash of one part muric attic acid in seven parts of water, uh, except for spots that uh, might need a stronger application to bring them to the desired texture. The panels were then uh, ready for shipment. Mosaic slabs are shown being placed on a trailer truck. The slabs were stored both in the yard and on the truck on wooden easels. To give you a little more information about the, some of the uh, mix designs, uh, the mixes were made uh, uh, on the slabs were rather unique. For aggregates uh, used by the Mosaic Associates, the Dextone Company, well, at that time, uh, they set up a crushing facility, their own crushing facility for uh, the aggregates in Reading, Connecticut. And they had the only crushing and grading facilities in the United States which were devoted exclusively to the production of aggregates for architectural precast. The aggregates used in most mosaic pro projects had a hardness about seven on the Moise scale, approximately that of uh, carbon steel. Colored granite, quartz, ceramic, or por porcelain vitreous uh, from all over the world were crushed and, gr and graded to the proper sizes to produce the facing portion of the mix. The crushing methods gave a, a cubical shape by using a hammer mill as the final crusher. Rounded or cubical particles not only uh, assisted in obtaining a dense uniform texture, but their shape assured maximum embedment. The fines or sand also were for the same crushed materials. The sand was very clean and free of dust as the dust might act as a pigment. The aggregates were shipped to all of the mosaic plants from that one location. These are uh, some of the uh, vitreous and uh, ceramic aggregates that uh, were used. You can see that they had uh, some very bright or little duller uh, colors. The ceramic aggregates were made from high-grade clays and other ceramic raw materials by processes similar to those used in producing pottery and chinaware. The vitreous aggregates were made with materials and by methods similar to those used, in, used to produce uh, porcelain fritz or glass. While the colors of ceramic aggregates are bright and clear, they are characteristically soft in color. Vitreous aggregates are distinguished by their greater luster and brilliance than the ceramics. Certain colors can only be produced in the vitreous type of aggregate. The strength of the color of the concrete made with colored aggregates depend largely upon the extent which the exposed surface is composed of aggregate particles. A coverage of 80% is about the minimum which produces satisfactory results. Mosaic mixes obtained a maximum of 85%. Those of you that uh, may have been to the, uh, uh, what's that place called, the Baha'i Temple? <laughs> the Baha'i Temple in Wilmette. If you go up and look very close at the area, you can see how dense Early was able to make his mixes. That's what gave Early's uh, precast uh, concrete. It, it, it's really, uh, it, it's beauty. Uh, it, and it, also, if you go to see Early's homes out in Colesville Road, 
which hopefully when we have the convention in Washington will uh, make the trip. Uh, the denseness of, of the mixes are something you, you don't see on too many projects uh, today. Although when we're in Minneapolis, those of you that may have gone out and looked at the precast at Minneapolis, they were uh, of the quality that uh, early did. This is, to me, one of the uh, critical factors in uh, exposed aggregate concrete gap grading. Uh, and I assume most of you know what gap grading is, uh, which is where you leave out uh, particular size uh, particles and uh, with intermediate sizes between the uh, coarse and finer materials left out entirely. Uh, this provides a, a step or gap grading uh, which uh, was established in experience uh, conducted by Professor Robert uh, McNeely, which was described in Engineering News Record November 27, 1915. Uh, Early studied all the literature and patented in 1921. You know, Deborah talked about patents. You know, it would make an interesting uh, research project to look at all the concrete uh, patent. Uh, and uh, as I say, he patented the idea in 1921 of, of using the step of gap graded aggregate to achieve uniformity and color control for exposed aggregate. Uh, this was an important contribution to the development of architectural concrete since uniformity of, in the distribution of the aggregate in the surface and its exposure helps to prevent an uneven appearance. This is uh, some of the uh, typical mix proportions. The average mix proportions for the mosaic and early panel, panels were predominantly one part fines to four to seven parts of two or more sizes of uh, coarse aggregate. The aggregate cement ratio was approximately four parts to one, while the water cement ratio in a, in a very damp mix was as great as 0.53 or six gallons per sack of white or gray cement, except for returns where it was reduced slightly to prevent uh, sand pockets. In many cases, color pigment was incorporated in the mixtures with colored aggregate rather than using pigments. It used the, uh, the fines, very fine fines. The backup mixes were uh, composed of 90 pounds of washed and screened concrete sand plus 306 pounds of crushed stone and were placed intricately with the face material. Once cast, the entire plastic mass of the panel was pneumatically vibrated a second time to ensure compaction of the material and draw the ex uh, exposed back face, uh, draw to the exposed back face any excess water. Uh, this was immediately evacuated by mechanical uh, means or by use of uh, hydroscopic materials so that the final concrete didn't end up at 0 0.53. It was probably somewhere hopefully around uh, 0 0.4 or 0 0.45 or, or less. The one problem with all of this, uh, all these projects that were done at this time was that uh, air entrainment was not developed. So this is part of the problem in conservation of, of some of these uh, projects. I received a call from the Navy about a year ago about the model basin that they want to do some uh, repair work. Uh, they, as, far, as far as I know, they haven't done it yet. Uh, surface texture. This is really what we're selling. Oop, can I speed it up. Uh, can we? Uh, the um, surface texture and, and uh, was highly dependent on the size of the aggregate. Uh, you went down from five eighths uh, to possibly three eighths, depending on the distance uh, that you were going to look at the uh, the panel. To prevent uh, the mixtures from intermingling, they used either metal stripping, such as using terrazzo, thin strips of uh, water composition, which were removed and the grooves uh, filled in with a uh, colored mortar. 
uh, small ribs or, or fins on the face or the uh, uh, plaster molds, or, or they uh, mold the recesses in the face or and on the uh, some of the depressions uh, were uh, just used to uh, separate the uh, panels. These are some of the uh, early panels by, uh, you can see the architecture isn't quite what we have today. And I'm really not sure if some of these buildings are still around. This is the Wyatt Corporation of America in New Haven, Connecticut. The Wilcox Building in uh, uh, Meridian, uh, Connecticut. And this is, uh, whoops. Back one, the uh, this is the Wilcox. Uh, you can see the uh, name is on a. It uh, uh, shows uh, you can see considerable detail. Uh, this is a spandrel panel. You can just barely see. There's a circle in the middle, and then there are uh, some horizontal lines. This is the Ansonia manufacturing uh, facility. The black aggregate was uh, cast intricately, as well as the. Uh, name uh, in the uh, uh, spandrel panel, which was serving as a uh, lintel. Uh, Deborah mentioned the uh, Merritt Parkway. This is uh, one of the projects that uh, uh, Dexstone did on the Clinton Avenue bridge that uh, they used. And let me just summarize. The creation of uh, quality exposed aggregate architectural components is both an art and a science. For over four decades, Mosaic Institute members pooled their technical expertise and craftsmanship to produce a product whose singular beauty and quality enhanced the value of outstanding buildings worldwide. The Mosaic members were not only pioneer producers, but industry leaders and innovators. Unfortunately, they were too wrapped up in their attempt to keep information within their organization, and they failed to see that the precast industry had acquired similar knowledge and techniques. Mose faded out of the picture in the mid-1980s, but the sharing of information by early studio laid the foundation for the growth of the architectural precast concrete industry that we enjoy today. Just some of the quick projects that the Mose people did, uh, they're not necessarily the old ones, but just an example of some of the quality projects. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>